Sam, you gotta understand that this is a lot bigger than any domestic problems you might be experiencing. Would it make you feel any better if you knew that what we're asking Matthew to do is a holy thing? You see, we're on a mission from God. First you trade the Cadillac for a microphone. Then you lie to me about the band. Now you're gonna put me right back in the joint. They're not gonna catch us. We're on a mission from God. works in mysterious ways. Yep. All right. This morning, uh, we're kicking off a new series, having a little fun as we uh, get uh, started with our summer. And, um, you know, we're on a mission from God. It's kind of funny. Uh, I found this graphic about a year, year ago. I thought that would make a really great sermon series. Uh, and, and just to have the play on with the, the, we're on a mission from God, from the Blues Brothers and all. It's just, just a fun thing to kick off our summer. Um, you know, I, I've been thinking about it. One of my favorite ways to hear about things is by word of mouth, right? Who, who doesn't like a recommendation from a friend who's been somewhere, uh, a coffee shop or a restaurant or, you know, they, a new neighborhood, and they, they were told by a friend, you know, how much they enjoyed it, how much they liked it. I, I love getting those kinds of recommendations from people. A couple of weeks ago, I got a message from a friend here at Homeport telling me about this new coffee shop downtown, and, and I decided I was going to go and try and find it, but I forgot about all the different one-way streets in downtown, and so I was trying to find this place on Spanish street but I never could get over far enough to get on the road that got me down Spanish street so I would pass this place so finally I gave up and I was like I'll just go find it another time but there's this new place it's called Rilampala which I'm totally butchering in Spanish uh it's coffee lab and uh and I love that it's called a lab that they're experimenting with coffee I love coffee I love the fact that somebody's out there experimenting with it trying new ways new bold flavors um, and so, but we get all these kinds of recommendations, and they're my favorite. And I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever gotten that kind of recommendation, a recommendation from a friend uh, to a new place or a new location, a new restaurant, a new, a new vibe. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you um, learn what's going on in your community or your neighborhood or even at work uh, from your friends, you know, we learn so much about what's going on from the people around us. Not gossip. We're not talking about gossip. We're not talking about other people telling us about the wrong things other people are doing. We're talking about recommendations, right? This morning, uh, we were talking about uh, the passing of Greg Ullman, and, and we were talking about this new concert venue up in Jacksonville, and Dee Flip and one of the ladies here, she was telling us all about it, and how this, this great spread they had out on the table in front of them, and all this other stuff, and I was like, well, that's interesting, if one of my favorite bands comes to town, I want to go and see them there, right? Because this is a nice, a new location. Uh, we've got friends in our new neighborhood, uh, JR and Maureen, and, and they were telling us about this block party. And at the end of every month, our neighborhood gets together, and they do a block party. And this weekend, they had this big block party. And yesterday, I get a text message, like, hey, are you going to make it to the block party? And, and we couldn't. We have family in town. And... Um, He's like, there's going to be a big surprise. And Chloe was like, big surprise. Oh, the pool's going to open? And he's like, no, Jack Sparrow's going to be here because they've been doing the, um, the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. And so they had big pirate blow up and, and, and Jack Sparrow from one of the pirates from downtown came dressed up for the kids. Uh, but we loved other people telling us about new things. Someone tells us about a new restaurant or a bank, a dry cleaner, or ice cream shop. Some of our, uh, our favorite places. So much of our news today, right? We don't learn because we waited till 6 o'clock to turn on the, the news. It's because somebody retweeted or they shared a news article or a news video. And we get all of our news you know, 24 hours a day right as it's happening. We know what's, what's going on around us. Um, and we just learn so much from other people sharing recommendations. And when we're looking for recommendations, right, we want them from people we know who've been there, who've experienced it, right? So much of, uh, of, uh, of what's going on today, I heard about these celebrities who are getting in trouble on Instagram because they're being paid for an ad and they're not telling people that they're being paid for it. So you think, oh, they really like this new juice or this new face wash or whatever they're, you know, sporting. And so they're supposed to put hashtag ad on the bottom and you look for it now on the bottom of when some celebrity tells you what they're doing. But we don't want paid people 
We want your recommendations. We want our friends' recommendations. We want them to be telling us about it, especially when it comes to important things, like right when we're trying to pick out a new bank because our bank's been ripping us off. We want to we want to know who's got a great bank you know experience or a new insurance company. You know, when our kids get to be preschool age, we want to know where you take your kids to and how who you love uh, in that kind of way. You know, I mean, we, it's all of these things we want to know where they come from, from people that we trust and that we love. And this is especially true for the church. When people are finding out about the church, not because we advertise about it, not because we put a Facebook ad, not because we have a billboard, not because we mailed them things, but because we, the church, have started talking about our church. And and it's our excitement and our passion for what God's doing. And we've got to be more excited about what God's doing here at Homeport. We need more people who are willing to use their voice, their platform to share about those things. You know, it starts off with simple things. Like if you're on social media, you check in when you come into Homeport. Put it on Facebook. Put it on Twitter. Check in at Homeport. Take a picture. You know, whatever. We do things like that. I hear these radio st- uh, this ad for this Toyota company up in Jacksonville all the time. And they're, they've started talking about all their Google reviews. People go on and write, oh, these Google reviews, like 4,000 people in Jacksonville have had positive experiences at Arlington Toyota. Shout out to Arlington. Not an ad. And, um, you know, so, um, but they, uh, uh, but, you know, all these people are reviewing. And you know what? People are going to go and they're going to buy a car because, they see you guys saying how much you love it, right? And, and the same thing is for the church. How many of us are comfortable going on Facebook and writing a review, going on Google and writing a review for the church, checking in, telling people that we were here? The early church got this idea of word of mouth. And uh, I don't know how many of you guys have favorite second century Greek philosophers who are atheists. I have a favorite second century Greek atheist philosopher. His name is Celsus. And this is why he's my favorite uh, atheistic uh, second century Greek philosopher. Because this is what he wrote about Christianity. He says, they went everywhere gossiping the gospel. They did it naturally, enthusiastically, and with the conviction of those who were not paid to say that sort of thing. Right? Get that. They did it naturally and enthusiastically and with the conviction of those who are not paid. We're not paid sponsors, um, but we just, they were out there everywhere gossiping the gospel. And this is what it said. They were taken seriously and the movement spread. Not because they sent out mailers, not because they had a guy with a big flag and he's spinning the arrow on the side of the road by the church saying, come with us, you know but because they were gossiping the gospel everywhere they went. Celsus in this letter, he's complaining to a Roman official about the spread of Christianity. He said everywhere they went, they were gossiping the gospel. He said when they went to the market, they were gossiping the gospel. When they had people over for dinner, they were gossiping the gospel. Everywhere they went, work, you know, everything that they did, they were sharing the story about Jesus. And the word spread. And eventually, this marginalized group, band of believers took over the known world because they were willing to share the gospel. And I wonder how many of us are comfortable with talking about our faith and what we believe, the fact that we go to church, that we serve in a ministry, about how God speaks to us through scripture and how we were reading our Bibles the other day and God spoke to us in the middle of it. And it wasn't a planned thing, but God spoke to me right there and what I was dealing with. And how he answers our prayers time and time again. This morning we're going to jump into the question of the day. And, uh, and just, just with the people closest to you, answer this question. How comfortable are you sharing about your faith? Take just a couple moments, turn to the people closest to you, and we're going to get right back together. So this morning we're kicking off a series, and it goes right in line with, the, with this idea that we've been talking about. And we say it all the time, the mission of God has a church. A church doesn't have a mission. There's not something separately apart from God, apart from the whole of Christianity that we're trying to accomplish. The mission of God has a church. And as we read through the book of Acts this month, and we study through these passages, we need to clearly understand it so that we can boldly carry it forward and take it to the people. And when we glorify God Together, by proclaiming the good news to a world who desperately needs it, amazing things happen. 
Amazing things happen. The book of Acts opens up. And, uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 1 says this. In the, my first book, uh, Theophilus, I told you about everything that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven after giving his chosen apostles further instructions through the Holy Spirit. And, and the, uh, the author, Luke, wrote the, the Gospel of Luke. And now he's writing the book of Acts to this official Theophilus, somebody who must have been really important that he got two letters that somebody would go out and and investigate all of these stories. Luke wasn't there from the beginning, but he comes back, he goes to Israel, he talks with the apostles, and he begins to collect these stories. And Luke does it in an amazing way. Luke was a doctor who, and he, you can just tell by the, the precise details that he uses on um, his education level, but he begins to compile these books for Theophilus. And now we have these books and we are, uh, have them to cherish and to hold and to understand. And he writes to Theophilus about all that Jesus has done. And he says this, during the 40 days after he suffered and died, he appeared to the apostles from time to time and he proved to them in many ways that he was actually alive and he talked to them about the kingdom of God. He wrote this story, this account of what was told and what the disciples encountered and and, and began to, to believe and to share and to take to the world around them this kingdom of God, this idea And it's not just for the first church. It's not just for those that were the closest to the story. But the book of Acts becomes marching orders for us. This is our mission. This is our role that we have to understand. Jesus tells his disciples in verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere. And for them it was in their Jerusalem and throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And for us, we take that to mean that we start here in St. Augustine and to St. John's County and to Northeast Florida and to the ends of the earth. That's our mission field. This is where we've been called to be witnesses. And the problem is, though, is that we've uh, fallen into the false idea that witness means expert, that I have to know everything about the faith. I got to know every detail, every theological argument. And a witness is not an expert. It's just a witness. You tell what you've seen and what you've experienced. When I was 16 years old, I was um, going to the courthouse in Marion County where I grew up. And um, unbeknownst to me, I uh, pulled into my parking spot. And all of a sudden, I hear all this commotion around. What I come to find out is a guy had busted out of the courtroom, knocked over all of these uh, sheriff's deputies, jumped off the second-story balcony uh, onto the floor of the lobby, rushed out of the... um, out of the courthouse and come barreling down the road, the part of the parking lot that I parked on. And now I'm freaking out because this was back in the day when you didn't have uh, electric windows, like you didn't like uh, hit the auto button and they just started going up. So I'm like reaching over as far as I can to run up this wheel. I'm trying to run up this wheel, locking my doors, praying that this guy does not get into my car and carjack me. No, he got into the car next to me, freaking out gets in there. I mean, there's 20 police officers chasing this guy, guns drawn. I mean, they're all, and um, gets in the car next to me, backs out of the parking spot. Cop gets in front of him. One of the officers gets in front of him, pulls out his gun. Don't move. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing every single bit of this. Guy inch forward, shoots him in the shoulder, pulls him out of the car. I go in to the courthouse. I come back out of the courthouse. They start asking me all these questions. What did you see? What was happening? What was the experience? I mean, like all these questions. And then I'm on the phone. I'm on the phone with the defense, and I'm on the phone with the persecutors. They're trying to decide. And finally, they settled out of court, and we didn't have to go in. But it was coming down to the line. But I wasn't an expert. I didn't know all the responsibilities of the police officers that were holding him in the courtroom. I didn't know procedures for when you shoot and when you don't shoot somebody. All I knew was what I saw. I was just an eyewitness. And when it comes to our faith, we're just eyewitnesses. You will be my witnesses, not experts, eyewitnesses, not scholars or theologians. We don't have to understand the complexity that there is sometimes in Scripture. We just got to tell our story, right? We're just real people who've had encounters with Jesus. We've watched the Holy Spirit move in our lives. We've prayed so persistently that we've given God time to answer our prayers. We just have a story to tell. And that, that's what Jesus is saying when he says, you're going to be my witnesses. Tell your story. But we have to understand our mission. Not a head knowledge, but an action plan. This is what we've been called to do. God has saved us 
and wants to use us to help share about his love and compassion to others. That's what he has called us to do. The Apostle Paul calls us ambassadors. We just are there speaking to others about what we have found in Christ. This is our role. This is a great role and an adventure that God's called us onto. The book of Acts lays out these stories of the early church living out these missions. I heard one guy say that there are 28 chapters in the book of Acts telling us about what everyone did and how they lived out their faith. And from that point forward, we have become Acts 29. We're the rest of the story. We're the next part of the story of Christians who are living out their faith, who are sharing the story. And you have a part and a role to play in the mission of God. This morning, I want to introduce something to you guys that that I've been really chewing on. I've been trying to figure out all the the elements and the pieces about this. Some things that are missing here at Homeport. I think they're missing from our lives. And And I think it's just that understanding and those tools that are needed to be able to share our faith. To be more comfortable with our faith. That we would be able to share it. It's something that I'm hoping that we'll be able to introduce later this summer or early in the fall. Um... And bring in some guys who can help us and and really train us through this. And this become a part of who we are and what we do and and how we share our stories. In your bulletins this morning, you're going to have found that there's um, some fill in the blanks. The first part is where it says my story and Jesus' story. And then the other part of that is how we, how we share Jesus' story. But it all starts with our story. I mean, what are we witnesses to? We're, we're witnesses to what God's done in, in our lives. And the guy, uh, his name's Troy Cooper. Um, he's uh, in this training video that I watched. He says, uh, he gets in the part where he, they're going to tell their stories. And he tells the group that is there, he said, I, I can, I'm going to share with you how you can tell your testimony in 15 seconds. And the guy in the audience is like, no, like you can't do that. He's like, all right, pull out your timer. Let's go. And so the guy pulls out his timer and he says, he says it like this. And this is my story. He says, there was a time in my life where I was hurt and I was angry. And that, that's my story. I grew up in a single parent home. My dad wasn't around. We were poor people. We lived in, you know, and, you know government housing really is what it boiled down to. Uh, but what I came out of that life was I was just hurt and I was angry. But one, one day when I was 14 years old, my mom walked into my bedroom on Sunday morning. She said, get up, we're going to church. And we went, uh, we got up and we started going to church. And I protested and I didn't want to do it. But what I found there was something I never, ever experienced in my entire life. There wasn't a counselor who took me aside. It wasn't a self-help book, but it was the love of Jesus Christ. And because I found the love of Jesus Christ, I received forgiveness and I surrendered control. And I was baptized on an Easter morning uh, when I was 14 years old. And now what I've found in my life is, is that I have a love and a peace that I can't, understand. I can't explain. I don't know where it came from. I don't know uh, how it got there. There's no like, clearly defined path. But because of what Jesus has done inside of me, I have a love and a peace. Now how about you? Do you have a story like that? Probably about 25 seconds. I'm working on mine. It's wordy. <laughs> but in this, this, this way of sharing our stories... We're just sharing what God has done with us, who we were before we received Jesus and who we are now that we found him. That's just all our story is. That's all that we can be witnesses to. So we share that. And when you ask them, now, uh, how about you? Do you have a story like that? Maybe they do. And you rejoice. That's awesome. Another brother and sister in Christ that, that has shared their story, that has found that love that you found. But what happens when they say, no, I haven't? I mean, what's the next step? We've got to have another like tool in our belt, that, just an easy way. What if we could be able to pull out a napkin and, and describe the story quickly and accurately? And I think we can, and it goes something like this. On the bottom of your, um, bottom of your bulletin, you have three circles. In the first circle, what we find is, is that God has a design and a plan. God had a design and a plan in the Garden of Eden that he would make man in his own image and walk with him and talk with him every single day. And it would be perfect. It would be exactly the way that he wanted it. But the problem is, is that sin entered into the world. And because sin entered, in, has, sin has entered into the world, there's now brokenness. And you could turn on the news any day of the week and you can see that there's brokenness. There's greed and there's murder and there's selfishness. 
And we try and, we try and find ways to deal with our brokenness, right? The squiggly lines are us trying to find our way. And we, we think that maybe materialism is the way that we're going to get out of our brokenness. And we buy and we buy and we buy. Or maybe we self-medicate with drugs or with alcohol. And we, and we, we do those things. But the only, only thing they ever do is snap us right back into our brokenness. They're never going to get us out of our brokenness. We can't get out of our brokenness on our own. What we need is we need a Savior, and Jesus came down to this earth, and the, you can draw the, the, the downward arrow, and, and you say, Jesus came down to this earth. He lived a perfect life for us, for you, and for me. He take away our sin by dying on the cross. But after that, he, wasn't, he didn't just die. He, he overcame the power of death, and he ultimately rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. And if we would just turn and believe and follow Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, we could be back in that plan that God has for us. And there we find restoration and we find forgiveness. And you're working through that, and you say, okay, now where are you? And they look at the circles, and the guy says, you know what, they're they're not going to say, but they'll point. And they they point. And if, if they say, I find I'm in brokenness. Where do you want to be? And they say, well, I want to be in God's plan. And he says, you open up your book to Acts chapter 2, or open up your Bible to Acts chapter 2, and you read what it says there. In Acts 2.36, it says this, So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God had made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah, And Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? This is you. This is where you're in the story. What should we do? And Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God. This is that turn and believe part. And be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you and to your children and to those who are far away, all who have been called uh, by the Lord our God. And then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging his listeners, save yourself from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and were added to the church that day, all about 3,000. Because they witnessed to them their story, and God's story. And what would it look like for us to pick up the daily rhythms of the early church, to do the things that the the early church did, to understand that we're on a mission from God, that that's our role, that's why we're still here, that, that our faith isn't a holding tank waiting for us to go to heaven, that we're not sitting here twiddling our thumbs going, okay, God, hurry up and get us out of here but that there's something for us to do. There's a reason why we're still here. And there's a rhythm that the early church had that I think we've got to get back to. Acts chapter two, down in 42, it says this, all the believers devoted themselves, devoted themselves. And I think that's something that that we've gotten away from. We've gotten so busy. We're so used to the busyness. We've let every little thing take up every minute of our time that we've not slowed down and created space and made a priority for our devotion to God. For the early church, they were devoted and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching So many of us are not reading our Bibles. We're not picking up scripture. We're not encountering God's word and what he has to say to us through it. But they they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to being together, to enjoying each other's company, to sharing meals, including the Lord's Supper. They were inviting each other over into their homes. They were going out and having dinners. And then they devoted themselves to prayer. They slowed down, created space, They were still before the Lord so that they could pray. And when they did, those prayers were amazingly answered. And it says this, A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place, and they shared everything that they had. Their devotion led them into something greater and deeper. It wasn't a a surface-level kind of Christianity. This was deep Christianity. They were willing to give up what they had so that others who were in need could have their needs met. 
It says they worshiped in the, at the temple together each day. They were corporately meeting together, but they were breaking out into their homes. They met in their homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity. We want to be people marked by that, by joy and generosity together, devoted, united. We think of all these words, and that's what we're seeing in this daily rhythm of the early church that we've gotten away from. And it says, and it says this, All while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people, and each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. They weren't just meeting together. They were sharing their story. They were witnessing, and the people were drawn to it because they, people are drawn to deep things. They're drawn to passions. And we've got to be those passionate people that, that people are drawn to. We've got to get rid of this surface-level Christianity that we've become so comfortable with. So why are you here? Do you understand that the church is on a mission to reach people with the good news about Jesus? That's our role, every single person. Not a paid person, not somebody who's a gifted evangelist, but that we all have a story to share, that we all have a mission to reach the lost. The mission of God as a church. And God wants to use you to help others understand his plan. That he has a plan for us. He, he wants to use us to share about the brokenness of humanity, but that there's a way out. That Jesus came down and sacrificed uh, himself for us so that we could be restored and forgiven. That's our role. This week you're going to have opportunities to gossip the gospel, to tell someone about your relationship with Jesus. You're going to have an opportunity to tell somebody about what he's doing in your life or in the life of the church. God's going to give you opportunities to share your story and Jesus' story, to pull out a napkin and to begin to sketch out the three circles. He's going to give you an opportunity to invite someone to sit with you at church. He just wants you to take up the courage and respond to that opportunity. There's an interesting line, a quote in the, the movie, We Bought a Zoo, where the dad is sharing this story with his son. And uh, he says, all it takes is 20 seconds of immense courage to get through it. And sometimes that's what it takes. We've got to well up enough courage that we'd be willing to say something, that we'd be willing to share with somebody and take those opportunities that God has given us. We all have people in our lives that we know need the good news. They need to know that there's a possibility to turn their life around, that God loves them so much that he sent Jesus down to earth for their brokenness too. Family members, friends, co-workers, neighbors, I bet you can envision somebody in your head that needs to know the good news. What would their lives be like if they found what you have found? What would their lives be like if, if they found the peace that God offers in the midst of trying times? That's how we get through it. What would it be like if they found a new life in Jesus? This kind of vision for life change and the people around us should inflame a passion inside of us. And a passion inside of us that causes us to share and to tell everyone we meet about Jesus in real and authentic ways. That's what it means to be on a mission from God. To understand that we have a lead role in helping get the good news out to those who don't know it. That's what it means this is what we've got to understand. This is our role. Why don't you guys pray with me? Father God, this morning as, as we begin to look at the book of Acts and as we begin to read through what, what you did through the early church as a template for us, help us understand this mission that we're on. Help us to know our story and to be comfortable in sharing it. Give us that, that strength and that courage in those moments, those opportunities that you give us to respond. Father, this morning, we're so grateful that you, would, that you would even invite us into a conversation, that you would even invite us to, to be used by you, to share our stories, that you think we're so worthwhile. And this morning, Father, I pray that each one of us would just understand our role that we would dig deeper and we would desire more, that we would be willing to be devoted to what you've called us to. Father, this morning I pray that you'd be with us.
that you'd speak to us in these moments coming forward. Father, we thank you that you've offered us a chance to be restored and forgiven, to be back inside of your plan, to have hope and peace. Father, be with us right now. Speak to us. Speak to us in a way that we have no other reason but to believe that it's you who is speaking. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Thank you.